Our next speaker this morning is uh, Matthew Bowen. Uh, Professor Bowen is a native of Orem, and despite the fact that he lives in uh, Hawaii, he is a great fan of BYU sports and of Utah jazz. Uh, uh, Professor Bowen got his undergraduate degree at BYU, then got his PhD at the Catholic University of America in Biblical Studies. While living in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, he met his wife, uh, the former Susan Blackberg. Uh, Matt and Susie are the parents of three children. They live in beautiful Laia, and uh, this is his word, not mine, beautiful. It's, but it's absolutely true, Laia, Hawaii where he's uh, on the faculty in the Department of Religious Education at BYU Hawaii. And uh, uh, when he says he loves uh, to spend time at the beach, I think it's because he lives in a place with such a beautiful coastline. Uh, Professor uh, Bowen. Thank you, Stephen. Brothers and sisters, aloha. Aloha. Hey, that was good. That was, uh, they'd, they'd even appreciate that back home. Um, my remarks today will uh, touch on it, at least somewhat, some of the things that we've heard so far. You heard uh, uh, Dr. Brown talk about the, the choirs of Levites, and we just heard um, from Tom Wayman on the importance of the body in, in terms of seeing the temple in terms of the body. And I'll, I'll have some things to say about that. Um, I want, I, I've been interested in some of the presentations I've done here previously in looking at etiological aspects of the, the Pentateuch and how those are relevant to, to the temple. Uh, how do I get the slides up? Hopefully it comes up. Yeah, perfect. All right, good. So, um, David uh, Calabro, uh, a, few years ago, a few years ago, talked about um, hand clasp verbs in in the Hebrew Bible, and the, and the hand clasp is a ritual gesture. Uh, Stephen has done work on this, this previously. I want to foc on, focus today on some other verbs of contact. Um, first, I'll, I'll have a lot to say about lawi or lawa, um, and, but also verbs of contact that double as verbs of temple architecture. Habar, uh, which means to, to, to be coupled with or uh, to touch one another, joining together parts of a building can even have the sense of to partner with. The verb naga, which means to touch, reach, or touch aggressively, which means takes on the meaning to strike, and the verb taka, which means to drive in. That was used of common objects of that verb were nails or tent stakes. That verb can also mean to thrust or even to th uh, fasten together. Um, and it, it's used to describe a custom or gesture of fastening hands together or striking hands together, which I'll say more about. Um, I want to start my remarks by um, talking about an etiology that we find in Genesis 29:34, uh, an etiology offered for the name Levi. Uh, this is done in the context of an offer, an eti there's a, it's a series of etiologies offered for the names of the, the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, this one from Genesis 29:34, where we read, and she, she, Leah, conceived again and bare a son and said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me, Yelaweh, because I have borne him three sons, therefore was his name called Levi. That gives us the, or Lewi, that gives us the basis of the, the naming. 
Um, it's interesting to see that the, 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 the etiologies offered for Leah's children previous to this describe um, difficulty in the marriage relationship. Remember, she is the less favored of the, the two wives of full status. Uh, Rachel's the beloved. Um, sure, so the, the explanation for the name Reuben is, the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, ra'ah ba'oni, therefore my husband will love me. Or, and then the next one, the Lord hath heard Shama that I was hated. That's the explanation for the name Simeon. And it, they're a co- kind of commentary on the Jacob-Leah relationship. Um, Leah then uses the verb lui or lawa here, yalava, to express the desired relationship. In other words, her marriage, the marriage relationship set in its proper order. That's, that's the sense of what the verb is attempting to express here. Um, looking back at um, Levi or Leva, the, the, this verb originally seems to have a sense of to tie around or to twist around and then thus having the, the sense of to circle or encircle or wind around and ultimately then it has the it takes on the meaning to join things together or to attach things. Um, again, we see um, this verb surface in an ideological context when we get uh, an, ex- uh, an explanation of, well, this is one of the explanations that we get in the, the biblical corpus of the relationship between the Levites and the priests. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. That's an idiom for to bear the responsibility of the sanctuary. And there's more that could be said about that. Thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity or responsibility of your priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee, that they may be joined, will you love unto thee. Alecha, and the, and the, the preposition that's used there, alecha, perhaps suggests the idea that they might be placed in order about thee or encircled about thee and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee before the, the tabernacle of the witness. So this text is establishing the proper relationship between priests, the Kohanim, and the Levites. Um, we get the, the language um, used in the Doctrine and Covenants going back to the New Testament, the idea of a, a house of order. We're getting uh, proper relationships uh, described here. I, a few verses later, continuing on this thing, And they shall keep thy charge, and the charge of all the tabernacle, only they shall not come nigh unto the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. They shall be joined wenilvu unto thee. They shall, or perhaps the idea here again is they shall be encircled about thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all of the service of the tabernacle. Now note this. This is going to be important to some texts that we'll talk about in a minute. And a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. There's prohibition here against um, foreigners. And you shall... Keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the elder that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. And behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel, a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. You get here in chapter 18 the use of these verbs, avad and shomer, which uh, Don Perry has pointed out, connect to the language of uh, the Genesis pericope and... Um, the ways in which we might see Adam acting, Adam and Eve acting in a kind of priestly function. Um, Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5. Here you'll notice some strong um, 
strong verbal echoes of Deuteronomy, not only Deuteronomy 23.1, but Numbers 18, the, the text we've just been looking at. Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself, here's the verb, hanil, hanilva, to the Lord, speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of, there's a contact verb, or hold fast to my covenant, even unto them will I give in my house and, and my walls a place and a name. Literally, that means a hand and a name. There, most scholars will understand that reference there to something like a monument and a name or a monument and a memorial. But there are multiple senses in which the, that expression could be under, potentially understood. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, a hand in a name or a place in a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Here we have the prophet speaking of people who have been, according to Deuteronomy 23, 1, and by tradition who've been excluded from the temple and from uh, the temple precincts being joined to the Lord or even joined around the Lord um, or set in a relationship to the Lord in, in the, the same way that we get Jacob being described in relation to Leah and then the Levites to the, the priests, the Kohanim. Um, I want to say a little bit more about the, I, the use of hand here. Um, you have the, this Hebrew idiom, Natan Yad, which uh, Walker says as a gesture signifies unity between persons. You get... Um, this is very much a, a covenant-like or an, you know, an alliance, the formation of alliance in 2 Kings 10, verse 15. Is thy heart right as my heart is with thy heart? And Jehonadab answered, it is. If it be, give me thine hand. Tana et yadacha. Give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up into the chariot. It's, it, there's some strong... Um, <coughs> covenant or ritual overtones to that this, this pericope and this particular event here. Um, later, you get this same idiom, uh, Natan Yad, when, as a part of Hezekiah's speech to the northerners, the Israelites who survived or managed to escape the, the net of the Assyrians when they were de deported in the, the latter part of the 8th century uh, BCE. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves. And the, note the King James translators there are trying to make sense of an idiom. They don't try to render it literally, but the, the idiom is, Give a hand unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Um, Walker further notes, in a society in which the clasping together of right hands was immediately recognized as a sign of agreement, such a simple phrase as hand to hand came naturally into idiomatic use as an affirmation, indeed or surely. We see this in... Um, Proverbs 11, verse 21, for example. Uh, King James, the King James translators struggled to convey, and I'm not even sure that the, the idiom was fully understood. Though hand join in hand, yad le yad, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the, the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Note how the New Revised Standard Version renders this, be assured, or surely, yad le yad, the wicked will not go unpunished, but those who are righteous will escape. Um, I want to come back to Isaiah, um, Isaiah 56 in that key text, and the, the language of 
joining. Also, the sons of the stranger that join themselves, and here again the preposition is all, join themselves to the Lord or encircle themselves around the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath day from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. My, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Texts like these, you, Tom mentioned a, a moment ago, the, the, with the, in early Christianity, you have, with the coming in of Gentiles into the church, you have now Gentiles being incorporated into to worship in a way that they never had been before. A lot of these texts in Isaiah that are very Gentile <laughs> inclusive were very important to them. And we, we find in the New Testament texts that describe Jesus' life and ministry, you get these, these texts quoted. Um, by, quoted and sometimes quoted by the Savior himself. Um, Jeremiah 50, verse 5, we see this same verb again. They, the children of Israel and Judah, shall ask the way of Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be for covenant, forgotten. Here the, the verb... Lawi or Lava is used as a, not only a, a covenant entry term, but kind of a covenant re-entry term. Um, this shows up, I think, for a final time in Zechariah 2, 10 and 11. That's verses 14 through 15 in the, in the Masoretic text. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and will dwell. Here's some temple imagery. Shakanti, and I will tabernacle in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day and dwell and shall be my people. Here you've got the, the covenant language of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and I will dwell, Vashakanti, and I will, ta or I will tabernacle in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. Um... I'm going to move some of this forward. I want to talk here more about Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 5. Um, the verb habar. And as Margaret Barker has pointed out, there is a, possibly a, a Janus parallelism going on here with the um, range of meaning for the words that are used in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded or pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised or crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and his, with his stripes we are healed. She points out that this might be um, appropriately rendered. The covenant bond of our peace was his responsibility, and by his joining us together, we are healed. In light of what Tom has said about early Christians and joining together on a in a in the mundane setting of house churches and, and the like, you can see why texts like the, these would become increasingly important to early Christians. Um, there's ar architectural significance here, too. The, the verb habar, um, which is the word for joining us together, also is the main term in Exodus 26 and 36 of describing the coupling together of the pieces of the tabernacle as well as the, um, the coupling of wings uh, touching one another and so forth. Um, and, and, and also the joining together of the high priestly clothing. You've got the ritual meanings of this verb that show up in Ezekiel when they get the description of celestial beings that Ezekiel is seeing in, in the way that they are joined together or touching together. Um, this verb all, or this word also shows up in terms of knots that, were, that had ritual uses in ancient Israel. Um, 
It's interesting that you have a couple purposes clause here that I'll just touch on real quickly. Um, purpose clauses for the tabernacle joinings, Exodus 26.6. And it shall be one tabernacle, or that it may be one tabernacle. That it may be, that it all may be one. You might note here, perhaps, um, language that echoes the, the language of the high priestly intercessory prayers in John 13 and 3 Nephi 19, that they may be one. Um, could say a lot more about that, but we'll move forward. Um, I'm going to say, since we've talked a little bit about the New Testament today, th this idea would, not only in terms of what Israelites had understood the temple to be, but what, how Christians would understand their community the, the nature of the community going forward. I'm reminded of Colossians 1.17, tapanta en auto sinistikin. Literally, all things in him stand together. Um, uh, this reminded me of the temple language of Moses 7.30, thy curtains are stretched out still. It's the idea of uh, sort of a, the, the temple is representative of something much bigger, the idea of the the cosmos and the way that it holds together, but this is also the language of the idea of the body and the way early Christians would have understood um, Paul's analogy of the body. First uh, Kings six twenty seven, and he set the the cherubim with, within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of the one touched the wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. This connecting up of the, of the cherubim was really important to the concept of what the, the temple was and it was intended to represent. Um, 1 Kings 6, 29, and Solomon, Solomon carved all the walls of the house round about with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees, and open flowers within and without. In the holy place and the holy of holies, which were essentially one room partitioned with a veil, uh, the, the high priest and the priest were literally encircled about in their service by representations of heavenly beings. Now, I think this becomes really significant. I, for, for example, I think the that this reference doesn't look right there. I think that's Actually, First Kings, uh, or se I, that, I think this is actually Second Kings six. The the reference here. So ignore the First Kings reference. And when the servant of the this is Elijah or Elisha and his servant. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and his. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. What this is, um, this text expects the reader to picture is a cosmos or a world in which there are we are encircled about or surrounded by unseen, unseen beings. Um, all of this should remind us of the events of 3 Nephi 11 through 26, 27. Um, here we get examples of angelic or priestly encircling. And here I'm reminded again of Numbers 18, 1 through 6. And as they looked, behold, they cast their eyes towards heaven, and they saw the heavens open, and they saw angels descending out of heaven, as it were, in the midst of fire. And they came down and encircled those little ones about, and they were encircled about with fire, and the angels did minister unto them. Remember the surrounding Levites that they were to minister to or attend to the the Kohanim, the priests. Um, we see something similar in, in chapter 19, verse 14. And behold, they in, 
were encircled about as if it were by fire, and it, and it came down from heaven, and the multitude did witness it, and did bear record, and angels did come down out of heaven and did minister unto them. Um, it's interesting, in this very same chapter, ver just verses later, we get distinct echoes of the priestly blessing of Numbers 6, ver or Numbers, Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 27. Matt Graves pointed to this, the strong connection with the, the priestly blessing. There's a lot of priestly um, temple, priestly temple type things going on in this part of the text. Um, and note, it's Jesus quotes Malachi chapters 3 through 4. It's Malachi, incidentally, then chapter 2 defines the priest as a malach, as an angel. And then these chapters that Jesus quotes talks about the sons of Levi, angels and priesthood, um, to the Nephites and Lamanites, and that will sort of con come on the, the latter end of Mormon's inclusion of what happened there. This incident is very similar to Helaman 5, 43 through 48 as well. Um, I'm going to move because we're running quickly out of time here. So um, Nephi being encircled about at the gate. Oh, Lord. By the way, wing, hem of the robe, cut off. Those both share the same term, range of meaning. O oh Lord, wilt thou not shut the gates of thy righteousness before me? O oh Lord, wilt thou encircle me around in the robe of thy righteousness? O oh Lord, wilt thou make a way for mine escape before mine enemies? Um, I could say more about the fastening of hands together. By the way, that was an idiom proverb in Job and Proverbs that denotes to strike hands might really mean to clasp hands or fasten hands together. <coughs> Walker describes this idiom as denoting a vigorous handshake. Um, I'm going to... Close with this. Um, going back to... Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, or 9 through 10. Um, envisioning the, the, the temple as a, a symbol of connectedness, that even Christians without the temple, a, a temple to go to would be able to appreciate and would um, help give expression to the way they understood their community. Having made known unto us the good will of his pleasure according to his good pleasure in which he hath proposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both things which are in heaven and all things and, and which are on earth, even in him. Um, Ephesians 2, Paul this is language that strongly echoes Isaiah 56. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom all things being fitly framed together, note the language of connection, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are builded together for inhabitation of God through, through the Spirit. Now, note it's the people here that are being described as temple. I think that is relevant to what the prophet Joseph Smith was trying to teach the, the saints near the, near the end of his life. Uh, going to Doctrine and Covenants 128, and again in connection with 1 Corinthians 15, 29, I will give you a quotation from one of the prophets who had his eye fixed on the restoration of the priesthood, the glories to be revealed in the last days and in a, a special manner, this most glorious of all subjects be, belonging to the everlasting gospel, naming, namely the baptism, baptism for the dead. For Malachi says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I might have rendered a plainer translation to this, but it is sufficiently plain to suit my purpose as it stands. It is sufficient to know in this case that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link of some kind or another between the fathers and the children. 
upon some subject or another. And behold, what is that subject? Baptism for the dead. For we without them cannot be made perfect, neither they with be without us be made perfect. Um, then he's going to quote the first part of Malachi, the part where he talks about he shall purify the sons of Levi that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. What is that offering? The prophet says that's the work for the dead. He shall pur purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Therefore, let us as a church and a people, as Latter-day Saints, offer un unto the Lord an offering in righteousness and present in his holy temple, when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead. What we're being asked to imagine and picture is um, that, and we have give expression to this in the temple, the idea is, I will go, go before your ha face, I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts and mine angels round about you to bear you up. Thank you. <laughs>